Hi, I'm Seamless, and this is the part two of the making of Ammunition, the sound design part. And boy, is there ever going to be a lot of it, because this song is the first, as I mentioned in the last video, the last part of the making of that. This song is the first one in the sequence of the album that is actually sort of from this time period, where the other ones are older and from older times. This one is pretty modern and full of pretty much most of my tricks when it comes to uh, designing sounds. <laughs> And such. I'd like to remind you that you can actually purchase this FLP and have it available to yourself. If you like to look at it yourself and get your hands on this, this sort of th sorts of things, you can do that at thefixedstore.com slash seamlessr. Link in the description of this video. Uh, you, want the, you want the deluxe version of the EP. You can get individual EPs. You don't have to get the whole thing together. Or you can get the whole thing together and there are some discounts. It is this exact FLP that we're looking at right now. Whoa. I also like to remind you that the songs themselves are still copyrighted, so you can't just take sections of it and put it in your song and say it's yours. That's not how copyright works. You can, however, take the patches and the presets and just do what you want with them, but, like, you know, it's got to be your songs. This is news to a lot of people, apparently. Um, yeah, so let's get, let's get started. Um, in the last video, I mentioned a particular confusion as to why I had two of these ARPs, because for, for as much as I could tell... They're the same thing, and uh, what they what they are individually is um, harmers. That uh, not this one, this one, last the other one. Is this this one? This is the first one. This is the one that I made first. The way that I do arps in FL is that I'll take I'll make whatever patch I want to make, and then I'll uh, go to the um, miscellaneous functions tab. In this case, the only functions tab in a plugin, and I'll engage the arpeggiator. And what this does is that it turns whatever chord I play into an arp. It's a super easy way to make rather standard arps. They kind of go in a direction. There's a couple of changes. There's a couple of sort of options you have for it to do whatever. It's also just a randomizer function, which is nice. But and it's also straight up like you can pick a scale. And it does some strange things. Like in the automatic mode are the ones where you hold a chord and it'll play the chord. But if you turn it on to the, any of these modes, the scales or whatever, it will arpeggiate the entirety of everything you put in there. So if you make a chord, it'll just arpeggiate the chord of the scale, which is kind of funny sometimes. Um, so it's pretty good to just make real sort of unimaginative arps, which I didn't really need to have much more than that for what I wanted out of these. So it wasn't that big a deal. But if you want to make more complicated things, you might be better better off doing it manually, which I do still do sometimes. But most of the time, though, I don't. So, uh... Let me get to a part of the song where it's actually, like, all the way on. Yeah. Let's see, now it's number three. Um, so, like, right off the bat, the main difference between number two and number three here is, uh, or rather, number three and number four, is that there's this one has the B side engaged. And the B side is just a bass. And the reason we can't hear it is because they're both being high-passed. And that's because at some point when I made the song, I decided that um, that bass didn't sound right. So instead of just turning it off, I just high-passed it. So now I have two identical ARP patches doing their thing. And then that's just the end of that. It was just a, a weird decision tree. So the actual ARP itself is a, just a gigantic super saw. I'm not doing a lot. Like, I screwed the hell out of the harmonic gears and pitch window. But when, when I do stuff like this, I'm not really going after a specific result other than just weird. And if you're not familiar with what this does, this is, um, this is the window that controls how much this parameter exists per harmonic. So your typical units of control is you, you have like a center, which is like all correct in the pitch, and you have number of voices, and then you start to detune the voices farther and farther away evenly from the center, which is the regular pitch. In um, this particular way, it does that, but it does it per harmonic, is where a regular synth would do it as for the whole complex voice. Uh, this is one of the reasons why harmonic is particularly kick-ass. Um, am I using a pluck? I think I am. Yeah, so I got I got this pluck uh, envelope going on on the low pass filter, which is a leg low pass, which I don't even really know what that, what that means. I just kind of pick pick a shape. It's just a low pass, and you, the whole point of you know again added this added this this is that you're able to kind of control a lot of the stuff per harmonic. I could have made a more interesting filter, but this is this sound is not designed to be interesting. It's designed just to be there. A little bit of prism, which the prism, what that does is that it changes the pitch of harmonics according to this graph right here, which I didn't change at all. This is just the default graph. If you can change it, you can do what you want with it, but the default configuration just kind of makes this weird 
uh, bellish configuration to make it to turn it to turn around. Uh, I have uh, harmonic randomness all the way on. So what the randomness does is you have two modes of randomness. It's phase randomness, right? So in this side, it's pretty much re regular random, re regular kind of randomness where it'll randomize where it starts in the phase of the waveform. And then on this side, we have spectral random where it randomizes the start phase of each individual harmonic. Notice a trend there for when we're using Harmer. Um, and this makes it, this essentially turns it into like, if you've ever seen me use Citrus, where uh, I'll like, have a saw wave, have a saw wave. And then I like turn it into harmonics and then randomize the phases. That's essentially what it does every time you hit the note. So it's like it re. That's what that's what the randomized phase of option does up there. That's what that's for. And it gets that result where it's sub, where, where it's not random. It's a lot sharper sounding. When it is random, it's a bit much, much more cloudy. And for the sound, it particularly worked for itself to be to be that cloudy. A little bit of that is also engaged by the phase over here, because if you turn it up all the way, it turns into what it calls full blur, which I'm pretty sure just does that. I'm pretty sure that's just what that does, and, it's a, and if it doesn't, it's a very similar result, and then the two of them together creates a much more of that result. Uh, that's pretty much all that's happening here. In the effects, it's high passed, just to, just because whatever. It's also really, really quiet, and I may turn it up. Nope, that's just there. This is how quiet it is. Those two particular arps, I'm pretty sure, only show up um, in the beginning. And then maybe in the uh, this side over here. No, that's an entirely different arp itself. So it's really, it's only in the intro. There are other arps, and these arps are the ones that are a bit more common. So this is a little bit of a weirdness of routing where there's, these are two different ARPs, but like ARP number two is routed into ARP number one. And I, I, I this is not exclusive to this song. It might be exclusive to this EP, but like I, in the past, what I, the, why I would do that is I would make a sound and then I would make a different version of the sound that's still kind of the same sound. So I would put it through the same processing, but it gets its own separate, it gets its own, you know, part of the chain so that I could do whatever specificness to that sound, to that sound and not have it affect the original sound. I could just clone the thing, and that would have been a lot easier. But I, I have certain certain strange workflow ideas that I just kept from you know before. Um, the notes here are actually kind of important. This, this is these are, these are other arms. These two are pretty much always together. And being side chain, I guess. Come on. I mean, a bit. It's also being low pass. I'm sure. Yeah. That introdu 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 introductory low pass is there, you know, to be be very intro like. So two of them, we have this guy, which is what we hear the most of. It goes down, and we have this one that goes up. And the note value here is important because, for some reason, when it goes down, it doesn't like to start. It's. You see how that's kind of odd. So like, I put this, I put that there like this to ensure the note order, because that high note needs to be first in the order for it to show up where it needs to go later, because it's not always like, it doesn't always start there, but like, the particular tone that shows up like over here for a second, for example. Like for that, to be, for that to be doing that, it needs to be that order. Although I think for these, I just straight up, straight up do it. Yeah, huh. So that's, that only happens for um, these couple of guys in the beginning. It's, anyway, it's, it's there to enforce the timing. Because it didn't for some reason. Um, anyway, the sounds themselves. And all the stuff we had. Yay. Oh, yeah, we're in the drop. I forgot about that. Did I not turn off? The oh, yeah, that's right, the free balance. So, much like the other guy, there's a plux involved. And this one is a little bit different because it uses sort of the, the brass stab approach. Where a pluck is where you just you start at a position in the filter and you go just straight down, and then sort of like the brassy the stab is where you go up really fast and then down. So it's not quite as sharp like a hit; it's it is like a weird like whip, and that's what's happening for this sound. And this this is the shape that generates that. Uh, I have vibrato on, which is interesting. This is there to kind of convolute the sound a little bit of unison, and I'm using the actual literal pluck pluck. Um, oh, and I'm using the phaser and frequency mode, which uh, the phaser typically is just a, a rolling filter that turns on and off the levels of harmonics in such consecutive ways that make it appear to be a phaser. And you can set it 
in the frequency mode to just accept that information, but turn it on to pitch instead. And I have it at a lower, low enough value because... <laughs> because that's what it would be like if I did. So that's sort of, that's sort of what that's for. What's going on? There's a phaser mask. Okay, so the lower notes aren't doing it so much. The lower, the lower frequencies, rather, are not doing it so much. There's the handy dandy little, little thing that's telling us where the fundamental tone is. So honestly, it's not really all that much going on down there. That's that's not doing it. Most of it's still doing it. But it's not doing it hard enough for it to really matter. Um, There's not a lot of epic happening here, here, really. This is pretty much it, as far as the sound goes. Well, at the harmer stage anyway, because the next thing that happens is it gets uh, processed with this sort of order. So we get we got a high pass, this is sort of the basic kind of EQ, and then we have Valhalla Shimmer. We got some uh, delay and reverb and compression over here to kind of bring it in. But Shimmer is a whole other beast. Shimmer is a reverb developed by Valhalla DSP. Um, you can use Google, Google this, you'll find it. And it's called a Bucket Brigade Reverb. It's a, it's a technical term that means something that I'm not totally sure what, because I never bothered, bothered to look. <laughs> what it means, though, is that Valhalla is particularly good at um, screwing with the pitch of your reverb. And not so much in sort of a very traditional way. Like, it's uh, maybe too much of a traditional way. Point being is that when you have the feedback up, I have the shift down. That's interesting. So that actually means it's going down in pitch. You can kind of hear it doing it. I also have the mod depth really far, really far up. So, like, it's modulating the bass pitch, but then the pitch is, itself is also kind of moving down a lot. Um, in this case, it's moving down an octave. And, it, it, like, how hard it goes. Like, if I were to just crank the feedback. You can kind of hear it doing it. It's a very hard plug to control. And it's not because it's a bad plug. It's just because this particular style of reverb is just... It's not designed for short sensible sounds it is all it is gigantic mess pretty much always and even when you turn the value the values down to the point where you think it wouldn't be a mess anymore it's just a shorter mess so it's it's just a bit difficult to control but it gives it it's actually it's it's creating the primary effect of this of this particular sound especially with the other guy in there that leads us to make it feel like where we have a kind of like a stringed orchestra thing going on like that that little reverb tail in there gives us the texture that makes us feel like, oh, there's like, a, like a, some strings in there. Which, as I mentioned in the uh, arrangement videos, we are if we listen to that directly, we can very clearly be like, okay, well, no, there's no strings there. But when we hear that sort of volume automated in between things, Like right there, that really adds to the atmosphere. And then earlier was what that song sounds like without side chaining. And we have this really balanced. This this is just basically the volume control. It's just turning the thing on and off. It's really just all that is. Uh, this is the EQ that I was using to be the low pass control. And I think this is also one. This was this must be a harder one. I'm not totally sure what's up with that. No. Do I even automate this? Hey, I'm automating it. <laughs> I love I love this track archaeology I have to do to make sure make this thing make this stuff make sense. I'm really not totally sure what I did with that, but it is a gigantic low pass. It must be this thing. Nope. Not not a clue. I think I must cut it in and out at some point to do something. Hmm. Anyway, it's a low pass. So like if you ever hear a low pass, that's one thing it's doing. Although there is another one that is also a low pass. I'm just not terribly organized with my with my with that stuff. And like. You might be thinking to yourself, oh my god, this project is so organized, I can look, I can see everything. I just want you to know that I only, I do this after it's done. This is not what this project looks like when I'm working on it, and it's not even what it looks like when it's done. It only looks like this because I'm selling the project and I want it to be organized in such a way people can find out where stuff is. That's all that, this this happens, this is like, the way it looks is like utterly unrelated to the actual process of producing it. Um, yeah, so that was, uh, both ARPs on. We got two of them. We had the high one and the sort of this sort of subdued one that's going in one direction, and this guy's going the other direction. This is actually, like I said, it's a similar version of the same sound, which is why they're both in such a similar location. So this one has less pluck, uh, not as not as high as a filter, and um, 
Other than that, the, everything else is pretty much identical. This is going in a different direction. Uh, so yeah, th th this guy shows up. Do I automate the reverb of the hammer? I do. Oh my god. So I guess I, I mentioned this in the arrangement video, but this is a very late addition to the song because I needed there to there, there be something in the beginning of this for us to sort of fill it out. And this is actually a pretty direct inspiration from Feed Me's uh, sort of electro stuff by having having some kind of like really harsh sounding, distorted, like almost just a saw wave kind of a sound. And I was like, okay, I'll just do that. And uh, that's more or less what's happening here. Um, I have a volume envelope. But the interesting part about this volume envelope is the fact that it's it's just a volume envelope. But the interesting part of it is that how much distortion I'm putting it on it. So that means that like the volume turning down doesn't really make it quieter until it's off. But what it does do is it slightly modulates the sound over time. And it's a little bit weird as a result. What else am I doing? Um, pitch, oh, big ol', big ol' pitch fall, which is causing this sharpness. So without it, and then with it. So that, that little extra bit of, like, business at the beginning is the, is this pitch fall. Really big pitch fall. It's really fast. And I believe I turned, yeah, so I have envelope granularity all the way off. This is where it is by default, and this is where it goes. What the hell is envelope granularity, some of you might be asking. It's essentially, uh, the resolution of these envelopes. Because, I mean... This is a curve. I don't, I don't know how many of you have taken, you know, algebra or high enough levels of whatever math that you encounter kind of curves like these and you have to calculate it where you have to use calculations to define positions of it because actual values are not representative of the totality of it. Which is to say that its resolution is technically infinite, but computers can't do that. So we kind of we kind of pick and choose how close we adhere to these particular curves. And envelope granularity means the, the more, the least... Uh, it's a time-based thing. So the less time means the higher resolution. So in this case, it's measured in milliseconds, and the lowest value is half a millisecond. So that's when, it's, that's when it samples, essentially, the position of the envelope, and that's what it uses to determine its uh, shape. Um, it's not always necessary to do that, but with something like this, where we're doing something so fast and so sharp, you need to have a, little, a bit more for it to really be fully there. So like, if I didn't have it, you can, you can kind of see, like, this is this is the information that Harmer tries to create to make the sound, and if I do it again, you can see something. There's a lot more, and maybe 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 not that might have not actually made much you know difference in terms of like what's happening here because of the stuff like the distortion and then the and then the phase randomness which takes away a lot of the sharpness, and I also I also got rid of the ramping because the ramping is it ramps, <laughs> you know it's it's like a declicking kind of thing. It's not actually literally declicking because there is also declicking <laughs> declicking. Oh, I can't say that word as fast as I want to say it. Um. Up oh, and uh, so that's that kind of deal, but um, yeah, so the main sort of tone of this is actually created by the low pass filter, which I don't think I ever move. It is, however, keyboard track, so like you can see the big old resonance peak, um, resonating peak kind of follow with it, it's because it's following with it as opposed to not following with it. Uh, it's like auto engaged. Uh, distortion and then in post is mostly just EQs and then I think I have a Why do I have two of these? Is this a high pass? I think I'm high passing it and then I automate it. I, I just don't know That's kind of weird that I would do this in two different EQs Especially since one of them kind of already does it uh, I apologize for my nose my nude Neat Oh this dude all right, so I can't actually show you what I did to make this because it involved using this stuff. But um, the sound, I believe I'm, I'm using some, oh, I'm not, weird. Because I, I did pretty much all of what I was gonna do with it all at once and then that's the sound now, so then I, 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 I'm low passing it to bring up the end there. But, um, if ever, actually, in some of the other songs in this EP, I've done similar sort of risers with, like, sisters and whatever. And it's, you, like, the FM-based risers are pretty 
pretty great because like FM is really really fast. So this means that you can like start off going like wee 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 up up until you start getting you know shepherd's tones. But um, so I just did that with this, and I also just modulated it whatever just a shit ton of parameters. I'm pretty sure I used the DPO and like the uh, Quark Asmatron filter, and I just modulated a whole bunch of parameters and the modulation a lot faster at the, at the end, and that created the sound. Um, not a lot of other processing happened. I, I may or may not have had the, this analog delay, the replicator, the Pittsburgh repli replicator, um, when I did this. But and I think part of the um, sort of the reverb -re sound might, might be coming from that. Might be coming from that, or I might have used reverb -re 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 in post. I don't remember. But uh, it's actually a, I, don't, I don't know if I ever used the whole thing here. Like this, this is actually the same file. I just cut it up. But it's a very long, I, I just did a lot to make it a whole thing. Because I, I, um, this is the only instance of where I actually used the, the, any of my analog sounds in this EP. Which, a lot of the songs are old, so that makes a lot of sense. As, as I, didn't really, I didn't really have the setup or really even understand how to use it until kind of recently. But it felt sort of weird to have this stuff and not release an EP with some, with some of that on there. So, like, this, that's the sound I chose to have to um, make that. And then we have chords. These are relatively straightforward stuff as well. Oh, the peak controller. So, um, what's happening? This is pretty pretty average, super soft thing. Uh, the, the unison is decreasing over time. So it starts off kind of high and then goes a bit low. Uh, a bit kind of a sort of a pluck there. But it's, it's, it's not a lot of a pluck, but it's enough of a pluck to kind of get you get the point across. Am I not doing anything else? Oh, okay. I am screwing with the harmonic music pitch. So... And this is actually an extremely basic example of what happens when we do that. Um, this is essentially saying that the higher frequencies have more unison than lower frequencies. So we get more high frequency activity than we do, and it doesn't like ruin the tone of the low frequencies, which happens a lot with regular unison, which is often why layering is required to make some of the greater sounding super soft stuff, because like a lot of the qualities that sound awesome but high pitch values for higher frequencies don't work at all for lower frequencies. Vice versa, a lot of the things that sound right for low frequencies don't work for high frequencies, and there's actually a lot of frequencies inter interchanging missions in between. Some weren't the words I want to use, but you know what I mean, and it like the hardware kind of just solves for that because without making layers, you can just have the one sound uh, be what the setting it needs to be to make what you want to make it. Alternatively, you can argue that it's actually 516 layers, but that's uh, a little pedantic. Pentadic. Um, lots of uh, I turned down the granularity and no ramping for reasons. No ramping because I want I want the sound to like hit when it hits. Which helps when the ramping's off. And I guess I do have. <sighs> wow, sorry for that. I woke up and I didn't get a lot of sleep, and I'm going to the Netherlands tomorrow, so it's, I'm a little weird of that right now. Um, wow. Relax, seamless. The. Uh, I might have tried to do other things that mattered more. This pluck isn't sharp enough for me to be like, I need to get my envelope granularity up there. Um, it's, not also, it's also not curving, so that may or may not even matter. But, um, yeah, so that's this. That's the kind of hiss here. Most of what's happening is happening afterwards in Valhalla Room. And now we're seeing what the peak controller is doing. So the peak controller essentially is it's really, really fast and really, really sharp with its, with its decay. And what it means is that we only hear the reverb when the sound is playing. So there's no tail at all. That's what it would sound like if there was a tail. So this kind of makes it sound like there's like all that airy quality is just in the sound. Which I like a lot. And I have a fruity balance for reasons. I probably had to cut it a few times. Yeah, it's the, it's what, like every once in a while you'll see one of these kind of pop up. I don't know if that's specifically that one, but there's one there's ones where like I want all the stuff to cut out. And like if I didn't have that in there, then it would you hear like a, you hear like a teensy bit of a, like a hang. So like that's what uh, those what automations are for. Whoa. So yeah, that's uh, those chord sounds. I guess now we'll finally start talking about basses. Which is probably what all anyone ever cared about for these songs. So the first sound that shows up is actually in the chord stack. There's... Nah, uh, there it is. 
this is a pretty basic affair of uh, just like a regular sort of stack of just. Okay, I seem to have lied. Um, actually, this is sort of normal. This is sort of the harmer way of doing it. I would normally do a sound like this. <sighs> Using citrus because of that, that phase variable I mentioned before. But like, if I don't want it to be random, then in Harmer, you have to go to the harmonic phase window and then do one of these. So with this, this is a wave line type, and then I just changed the density of the waveform. And this is these are this is per harmonic phase. So we're actually able to set manually per harmonic with the, the individual phase of each harmonic. And um, sort of the value of this is that it creates that that sort of that position positional you know weirdness that happened when we randomized the phase in the uh, citrus example. But it's static. Like the like this just example, um, and then when you do that, you distort it. It makes it pretty all right, like raspy, papery sounding, you know, electro bass, which when you put underneath the chords, it it, it handles it nicely. Some unison to kind of help. Uh, here's the unison. Okay, so this is actually this is actually pretty important as well. What's happening here is that uh, the unison is really high, and then it goes all the way off really fast. It, this is essentially another way to mess with the faces a little bit. And what this is doing is that it creates a profile and then it goes down and it stops moving, but it doesn't go back. It doesn't look like it doesn't like reverse the profile as it being not used anymore. So this just makes it um, much more convoluted. And it also helps because now it's it's uh, it's panned. So like the, sta the static um, phase example would have been fine, but it's like perfectly mono. And then if you want to be even as, as evenly distributed, uh, like stereo wise as it was spectral wise we, this, is, this is the kind of crap you have to do uh and you distort that and then that's just kind of the sound and then i have in here a high pass which is almost never doing anything except for when it's all time by itself so and by, by itself like we, the um the chord bass it's it's in there when it's there but then like it also shows up by itself and then we use that we use that to kind of have a little bit of extra extra tone in there it also sounds like I had reverb. Oh, I must have reverb in the harmer. I do! Yeah! It was reverb. That sounds like it was a square. Works better as a saw. Like, the purpose of this particular sound is to fit with the chords. That's kind of its job. We'll talk about that, I suppose, when we get to mixing and mastering, although there's not really a lot to talk about. It's not, not you know, terribly impossible. I didn't even bother putting an EQ on this because I just used a built-in mixer EQ. Not a big deal. So then we have base one. First base. Bam. This fucker. So this base was much more of a problem with time than it was a lot of other things. I want to make a Reese, right? And actually, around when FL12 was new, uh, I was very enamored with the envelope controller because it enabled me to do a lot of things. One of the things that it did is essentially this, where I can output a macro control and have that link to whatever I want to link to, and then I can also do th I can I can then change the speed of that controller with just another one. That's what's happening here. This is keyboard mapping, so tracks where the keyboard hits, and then that's linked to the speeds of various LFOs, and that's triggering a whole bunch of stuff. But let's talk about the stuff. Uh, so this is like a layer, I guess. Those are really the two things that are happening. I don't even know where to separate these things. Okay, so this is a citrus, which by itself, okay, it's also, it's being modulated. Like the, the X mod is moving around with it. So let's look at what it's doing. Not a single thing. So this is a square and a sine wave going out. And like nothing, no volume, nothing is changing anything anywhere. I I probably elected to do something a bit more complicated and then just didn't because it got stupid. That happens a lot where I plan on some things being a certain way and then it's just not. And so then it gets distorted a lot, which also doesn't do anything because it's a square wave already. And then these are EQ'd. 
I have no idea what I'm doing with these. Like these gigantic peaks, I mean, I'm putting them, the gigantic piece is a distortion is not like an unknown idea. That just means that um, it's gonna get colored a certain way. It's like this one has that big peak and then it goes into a phaser, which again gets distorted. And because of that gigantic peak, we get that kind of like acidy sound. Which is getting further sort of modulated by the phaser. And this one is going directly into this Maximus, which is getting layered against a whole bunch of other stuff. Let's look at the other stuff. So this next one, this peak, is a bit higher up, and then it goes into a flanger as well. But this one's a bit different, because it doesn't... It's not as a hardcore as a phaser. At least it's not in the same way, and then it also gets distorted. That's what that sounds like. And then this last guy goes into a chorus. I see what I did there. Phaser flanger chorus. This one has a lot of bass in it, though, and almost no high frequencies. Does a lot of weird shit when it gets distorted. Turns into a weird, round, squeezy piece of turd. I really don't remember doing this. Um, and then all three of them get put into the compressor. And this is just mostly just evening, evening it out. Most I'm not even really compressing stuff. And actually, here's a good here's a good point to talk about sort of when to use compressors. When to use compressors? When to use compressors? Lots of people ask. They ask, like, okay, well, when when do I use it on a synth? Like, why do I use it on a synth? And, like, I want to, what what's it good for to be on a synth? It's a difficult, difficult question to ask because when you think about a compressor, you have to ask yourself, what's the compressor doing? What What is it compressing? And what it's doing is it's reducing dynamic range. With a sound like this, there is no dynamic range. It's just static, especially when you're distorting it. It's always max fully. So what about it over compressing? And the compressing part has to do with spectral dynamic range the idea that like okay it's doing that but it's not fully always like that for every frequency all the time especially with sounds that have a higher like modulation like a, uh, any kind of like band, like the band past double notch super neuro stacks that i do a lot there's a lot of reason to compress that because the dynamic suddenly it's dynamic as hell it's all like it, especially spectral spectrally dynamic it's just all over the place sound like this though is very very like solid which is why not a lot of compression is even happening to it this is mostly just like just kind of leveling it off the other part of it is that you can use compression as sort of like a sound design tool. And you do that by putting the time variables fast enough that's essentially becoming a wave shaper, at least in the case of Maximus. With any other regular compressor, you just turn it up fast enough, the time variables make it faster, that it just it just distorts like a regular clip, like a hard clipper. Hard clipper. Mm. So at that point, it's just you're just distorting it, but in a very specific and in control kind of way. Multi-band sort of distortion sort of sense. Uh, with the option to also not distort it and distort it less with the time variable kind of idea. I didn't mind even limiting it on the top end here. I'm just I'm tur it's turning it down low enough not to not to interact with it. This gets in to get put into a fruity balance, which is being reached. That's that guy. So let's see. This dude. Oh, there's a harmer down here. I didn't even notice. This is probably just a sub, though, right? Nope, it's also a thing. But let's look at the second thing. This is a citrus. It's also got its XY controller. And it's actually doing something. Okay, so what the hell is this? Now, like, I say that I don't remember what a lot of this sounds like, and that's because most of these decisions that I made, I made with the effects on already. And... A lot of changes. I, I didn't. I never really heard what they sounded like by themselves, which is why this is very confusing. But it's helpful, I know, for people to know what every step sounds like, so they know kind of if they're doing it right. If they want, if they want to do this weird bird sound. Okay, so operator one, sine wave. Operator two, a much higher frequency sine wave. Operator three, another sine wave. Um, and what am I automating? So, uh, I guess is it is it volume? Nope. Well, what's any of this? None of that. Must be mod. Yeah, okay. So, uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, mod and pitch. That's interesting. So, um, number, frequency output two here is essentially being FM to buy mod X. It's just pitch, pitch move motion from. And then it's being FM by three. Uh, and that amount of FM is being controlled as, uh, uh that's volume of operator two. So never mind. It's being, it's being FM fully and it's staying that way. And operator two's volume is 
doing that, so it's it's kind of, yeah. It's weird that I can still hear that. Oh, it's because of the effects. Yeah, so that weir weird width and wideness is coming from the fact that I have uh, the effects engaged. I don't have any use or anything. No, that's just that. So that's what that's doing. And this is per huge. It's going into the distortion. <laughs> Fucking fuck. And uh, I guess put it to a reverb. Which is pretty tight. And then what the hell is this? Oh my god, this is a Fector. Bit crushing? Yep, I'm just using bit crushing as some distortion. And I just thought, I, I remember I remember this decision actually. I did that because um, a lot of producers, way bigger than me, use bit crushing all the time as just like a primary effect. Not even in like the sort of intentional way where you put like a low pass saw before the bit crushing to make that like really old school dubstepy like yo sound. It's just part of the single chain to make to make just distortion feel that way. And I've just never done that because I honestly don't like bit crushing all that much. So I like I just elected to give that a shot to see what would happen. And that's what that's what happened. That's so loud. Like my speakers are so low. My god. Alright. And then uh, the third guy, Harmer. He's actually not being controlled by anything. I have the LFO in here, which is terrible because it's not being uh, controlled for speed. Okay, well, anyway, this is um, using a lot of distortion, obviously. Uh, we got saw with a little bit of that, that phase ran missing there. An octave higher than everything. Or maybe that's an octave... No, that's an octave higher than everything. No, that's they are, that's, that's correct octave. Uh, Harmer starts at uh, ratio 1, whereas Citrus starts at ratio 2, which is the same ratio system, which just means that Citrus is by default an octave higher than Harmer. So for it to be the same pitch, it has to be an octave higher. I have phase almost all the way up. I, th I think it's almost all the way up. Yes, it's almost all the way up. Which means it's just stopping just short of, it, of doing that full blur thing, but it still has like, a very wide phase profile. Um, harmonic unison pitch, so I just screwed around with the unison pitch a lot. Lots of unison, but like very low pitch amounts. And like this is this is serving cause, like, without this. Like with the, um, is it the filter that's doing this? Yeah, so it's the bandpass filter. It's a notch filter. This is a notch filter. Uh, is the only thing that's going on here? Yeah. And then, like, with the unison. You can hear it kind of moving around. And like, that little weird quality is, is a result of the unison, the unison pitch being a very kind of different for large selections of each frequency section of harmonics. Distorted. Uh, then EQ'd. Big old notch at 500 hertz, which is pretty great for, like, you know, that racy kind of sound. And that gets put into this. That actually has its own LFO. Okay, so this is why this particular this third one wasn't its speed wasn't being controlled for, which is why uh, when I when you, when you play them all together, you play a high note where the other two are changing. That one doesn't change. You get conflict. I don't know why I didn't make a change. That's really weird. I was probably just really bored of having working on this sound. Although, this is one of these sounds that, like, I would make, and then I'd be fine with, and then, like, the next time I hear it, I'm like, oh, and then I would change it, and I'd be fine with it, and then the next time I hear it, I'd go, ugh. So I just kept adding to it, to the point where, like, the next time, like, in the beginning of the song, I'm pretty fine with it, but then when, when it shows up in the B part, it's actually layered against another version of it entirely, like, a full other, other thing. That's why I call it 1B. Oh, this, this guy is, like, its own. He's his own deal. It's a lot less complicated, but it's still just layering on top of that. It's just additional layer to the whole, the whole thing. And that's that guy. Really only shows up for like some moments there. So the end, the end of the chain of the of number one here is that it goes into the ultimate compressor, and it's not even really like it's not changing much. It's just kind of limiting stuff because the, the frequencies are very everywhere. I'm also controlling the stereo spectrum a bit and then controlling it, and then it goes into the uh, mixer where it's getting just a teensy little bit of mixed. Not a lot else is happening. That's that guy. Next sound. A bit more interesting. At least to me. Hmm. 
Yeah. This is base four, right? Yeah. So this is really kind of what you'd expect out of, out of a sound like this from me, is that like it's uh, a little bit of harmonic harmer, harmer usage. This is kind of interesting. This is what this harmer sounds like by itself. And there's nothing imposed on this. Oh, wait, there's a lot actually imposed on this. So we have um, a little bit of reverb, which is actually being uh, balanced in every once in a while. That's why this is like a separate thing. Like it goes, it's going into both of these, and then this one is, these are like the buses, this is the bus. Another one of these weird mixture configurations that was probably not, not as super great. And also something that would have been solved pretty great by doing this in Patcher, but I'm not totally sure why I didn't do that. And then a bit of post-mixing with a lot of high frequency adjustment. But uh, this sound is basically a layer to go on top of this guy, which has all the automation. This is where all like the, this is where all the main sort of crap happens. So even when that's not happening, we still get this dude, which kind of was shut up for a second. Why? I wonder why. Oh, the keyboard mapping. This must be. This must have been to make the. Um, okay, this is a bit. This is a bit weird. I think this is a sub reinforcement that because uh, when it got too high, it got way too convoluted. It's like without this. <laughs> Yeah, this is something like that. So it only shows up when I play. When I start higher notes. That's an odd choice of decisions. I made a lot of weird decisions on this. Uh, ooh, ooh, chorus and distortion. Uh, unison engagement, and I probably have some unison, yeah, some of this going on. Like, this is really a very easy way to make sort of like even normal resounding stuff a bit more unique. It's just to go to the harmonic music pitch window and fuck with it. This particular example sort of means that like the the, the lower frequencies have more no, more distortion than the higher frequencies, less so much in the mids, not not at all. And like it causes that kind of like that is purely because of this. Like if it wasn't doing that, we get some uni some unison coming out of the chorus, but then with the unison. And the reason why this happens is because in regular in regular unison, like if, if we were to do just a usual re space, it's static because all the all the frequencies are, are the same kind of pitched apart from each other. But when they're not like this, it creates uneven higher frequency phase cancellation, which causes its own kind of like self growling, which is very interesting <laughs> to me. And then this sound. So in the beginning, it's a harmer. We oh, it's the same sound. Just without the chorus. So that must have been why I used the layer. I used the layer to kind of uh, accentuate the unmodulated version of it. And then that gets distorted predictably. And then uh, lots of automation. So this is a bandpass. Uh, what is this? This is a bandpass at three notches? Check it look up here. Bandpass. This guy. Notch, notch. And high pass. Okay. So one of these is a high pass. It's almost like there's two band passes because like a high pass has a lot of qualities that are like a band pass, which makes sense because a band pass is most usually accomplished. No, it's not usually accomplished. It can be thought of as being a, a, a high pass and a low pass together. But often a lot of a, modula a lot of modulation that happens with a, with a high pass filter, I've, ex I've, I've mistaken for band pass filtering. So having a band pass and a high pass is like having two band passes. And then two notches to go against that. So the way the thing, this is a bit different with this sound, but the way that the automation like this usually works is that the band pass is the primary rhythm creation. So like it, it's wow, wow. It moving up and down is what causes like the main kind of tempo of the sound. And then the notches just exist to kind of change the character of the sound. They can create their own rhythm as well, but like they're not as they're not as impactful as the band pass is. They don't determine like the window at which we hear the sound is determined by the band pass holder. And so the high pass kind of follows into both those categories because it could ha it could definitely disrupt the band pass, but it's also there to kind of create a character that the band pass can pass around. So like, as far as treating the animation, I mean, I still automate this like I do everything else, which is I just did random shit until it sounded right. Like this, 
these chops or whatever, like I didn't I didn't make any of these chops there. I didn't like put the sound there and then make the chops. I like when I was designing the sound, I had a big long thing with a whole bunch of motion, and then I would just change parameters until it sounded okay. And then when I went to go put it in a song, I would put it in the song. And then I would like move notes around, and then I would have big old bits of automation as this kind of like, see this just kind of keeps going. That's how that's how this works. And then I, when I when I make copies of the uh, of the drop, I go and I make I make various variations in that sound and like in these automations, and that makes a wholly new different sound. Like that's how that this kind of stuff works. Never have I ever really planned most motions involving this kind of automation. Every once in a while, I'll make a good decision that like I think might do something, and then I was I end up being right. But large, not because I not because I knew I was going to be right, but because I thought I was going to be right. And I just happened to be right. Uh, so, like I mentioned in the um, other other sound about compression, it's a big EQ before distortion. So, like. <laughs> When you do this kind of thing, you lose a lot of gain because you're filtering like 80% of it away. So you have to bring it back. In this particular case, I decided to do that with compression. This isn't the compressor, you might be saying. Yes, it is. It totally is. Distortion and compression are the same process. They're related a lot. And this, this exact thing would be right at home in a Maximus if I had time variables. It just doesn't have time variables. And it would also be a disaster if I did this without putting this EQ before the distortion. The EQing before distortion means I can I can sort of bring I can I can pick and choose which harmonics get to be the ones that are in the forefront and that the, are the ones that get distorted the most. Everything's gonna get distorted obviously, but the ones that are louder will get distorted more and then the, those will start to take up more space, that kind of thing. This is why putting EQ before distortion is way more effective than putting EQ after distortion if you're trying to like fix your distortion. And these decisions are ones that I made while I was listening to distortion with this on. So I just put this big old curve on it and then I was like, all right, I get Cause if I just like did that, you see how that really fucking. I mean, it's not just aside from regular equalizing, which that accomplishes, you know, just fine. It also colors, you know, how the distortion works off. And then we were able to regain most of our gain because it's just being crushed up against the distortion. And then this guy's there as a layer. Which I get now. <laughs> that's funny. Um, so that's that sound. It goes into the other guy to get mixed, and then this dude to have a reverb, which is this dude, this automation clip. And then I just kind of bring in a little ghost of verb every once in a while, and sometimes they yeah. leave it open. Yeah. Works out nicely. Uh, yeah. What's next? Oh, yeah, the next one is my favorite bass. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Yeah. So, another complicated looking thing. Let's get into it. This guy starts off as a bunch of citruses and he uses a lot of Pokedex. This is Citrus of Pokedex, it's kind of the name of the game of this dude. What do you sound like? Nice. All right. So here's our screwed up saw wave that we had before. But you can see I actually, I've actually like speci specified particular harmonics not to be screwed up. This is to sort of retain some semblance of sharpness that re 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 resembled like a saw and less of the cloudiness. The cloudiness is still there, but like it's 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 accompanied by some solidifiedness beneath it where some of the harmonics are aligned. Um, this is like a 100% kind of to taste thing. Like it's super rare that I actually like you know do a lot of this on purpose. I just kind of go, yeah, no, yeah, 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 okay. And then that's sort of what's up with that. Um, it's being ring modulated by this shape. So you could look at this shape and look at this, like look at this waveform, and look at this waveform. You can, you, can, you can think of this as being like a volume automation on this. So whatever's happening here, we're actually only hearing it right under this guy here. That's what that is. It's technically amplitude modulation, but we're doing it with ring modulation just with the waveform that's designed to do so on a single polarity. Uh, ring mod I mean, you can think of it as being volume modulation because it is volume modulation. Ring modulation is the same idea as frequency modulation, FM synthesis, um, only for volume. 
the difference between uh, ring modulation and FM in terms of like its primary method of doing it is that unlike FM, the shape that you're using is just exactly what the motion is. We don't have to worry about any of this, any of the whole change in slope speed business that is how you determine actual change in pitch for FM. Ring modulation just does it. Now, the dif difference between ring modulation and amplitude modulation is that ring modulation is a bipolar function, where amplitude modulation is a single pole function. Typical, so if, like, if you look at this thing, you have a positive, uh, positive oscillation and then a negative oscillation, and um, it would you would do both of these if you were to ring modulate it by the shape, which means that if you if you ring modulate something like this by a, something that's the same pitch, you're technically ring modulating it like twice per oscillation. You got two events. You have two uh, events of on and then on again, negative. So this particular one is only on one time. It's on very thin amounts, and it's uh, only positive. And we did this with the, the, the these modifiers up here that change the waveform and how, how they work, that kind of thing. This one makes it only um, only unipolar, and then this one uh, takes it so that it's only half that size there. But then, of course, we can you know change it and skew it and do all this other stuff and change the phase, which is what I did over here to to move this guy into position here. All of which I did while I was listening to it as well, because as much as I know that that's what this is doing. I wouldn't have known that that's what I wanted it to sound like at the time. I'm also FMing the, the saw by a sine wave just to kind of screw with it some more. I'm automating something. I'm automating that. What is that automating? It's probably this. Nope, nope, nope. Yep, okay. So the FM itself is, is, is being automated um, through this guy here. So that's causing the first, you know, line of, uh, of modulation. Now, the next serum, citrus rather, I'm going to show before I talk about this chain because this is the modulator. <laughs> Does that sound familiar to you? This is pretty much my earliest FM stuff where I, I took a triangle wave and a higher frequency triangle wave together and that created growl. <laughs> and this boy does that ever. And that's pretty much what's happening. I'm not doing anything else on this. I'm modulating. I'm modulating the FM here, and that, I, because if it's weird vo vowel -y nature, is what is causing the overall uh, sort of tone. And then, ha, huh, the bra. I remember this. Okay, so then this this EQ exists. Yeah. Looks kind of like a bra. So these um these two sections, like I, I could have done a little bit more complicated with this, but I just kind of wanted. I didn't want it to like. I don't want to move things so much as I wanted to like accentuate. Okay, now we're listening to the highs. Now we're listening to the mids. Now we're doing this kind of thing. It's very, it's very kind of like a crossfadey thing that happens. What happens when you do wavetable stuff? But I, not that I really plan on doing that. It's just sort of what that ended up being. It didn't seem like it did much. But uh, when we go into the vocodex side of things, let's also look at sort of this is what the distortion sounds like on the first guy. I kind of amplitude it a bit, and then the flanger to kind of give it additional tone and the, 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 the settings I use for these particular plugins are very random like I'm not particularly paying attention too much of what I want to do other than like delay and depth are pretty commonly pretty common parameters and that like if I want crazier sounds I go higher on those and if I want more reserved sounds I go lower on those there's also you know the, the rate of how much they change and all that kind of thing and the feedback also determines kind of like a very big important part of it because I have if I have a lot of feedback you get like the, it's really feeds back and then lower feedback is still doing it, but it's not as it's not as intense. And then Vocodex. So here's here's this. I'm automating the pitch. I'm automating a few things. I'm just automating the pitch. And distribution is even. So I'm not doing any kind of like any of the actually this is before I started doing the thing where I, I do one of these on hundred bands. So I'm keeping still keep this pretty low pretty low band count. And the bandwidth is also somewhat low. It's actually pretty low. It's pretty low all around the board, which normally would be a bad thing. But um, it actually worked out kind of okay. And a uh, low band count, it just feels better to me. Like, I actually didn't change any of these parameters, which I do, I do now. Uh, mostly because of uh, Virtual Riot. And then the modulator pitch shift. So what this is, like, Vocodex actually has a lot of sort of Harmer-esque controls in the sense that, like, for a lot of the main parameters, we're able to change their values per band. And that's what this is doing. So, like, it's saying that, like, whatever pitch information was here gets moved down and affects these bands that are down here, and so on and so forth. Which allows us to really screw with, like, form and control. 
And then, you know, while I'm in the pitch, like, it's really just kind of everywhere. Not a lot else matters about this. Uh, it goes into the hollow room. Which is mostly just there to give us, like, it's this tiniest extra, like, a, a t sound of, like, uh, sort of room. <laughs> Stereo is what I wanted to say. And then beefing it up with the compression. Another example of sort of spectral dynamic range. And then it gets mixed with this sort of the CQ here, which is now the main one of the main sounds. And then this other guy, what is this doing? Almost nothing. So this other citrus. That sounds like just what the saw wave sounds like without anything happening. Yep, saw wave and a sine wave. And with a bit more control on the, on the bottom there. But, you know, for all the good that did. Distorted a lot with this curve. And then a uh, huge hole in it, like the restyle kind of hole. And into a fruity balance, it kind of turned. Oh, it's off. I didn't. Did they do it this time or last time? That's weird. And then this is being mixed afterwards, but it go, it's going into a Vocodex as the carrier. And then the modulator is this guy, is the actual. And I have like eight bands, and hmm. Almost nothing is happening here. In fact, exactly nothing is happening here. I'm not really sure why I did that, but I guess sort of the result of that is that it sort of gives us a little bit of a little bit more extra high frequency sort of activity that's a little bit based on what's going on with them. Um, actually, now I remember exactly what I was doing here. So uh, I wanted essentially uh, essentially spectral note following noise. So like we had this sound, which is neat, but it doesn't have sort of it feels very thin at the high end. So then I wanted. Like the extra, like a little bit of extra beef in there, and I, I believe I'm automating this on. Yeah, so like, uh, I must be what this is. It's not on all the time, but when it's there, it gives us, it gives like just a teensiest little, little high, little high frequency feeling. And I, and the the vocodexing and the eight band thing, where it's like really small, so it's not really, it's not really format changing anything. But the position of it where it is is inextricably tied to the activity of the original sound. So like, I don't have to worry about like shaping it because it's just shaping itself. Shaping itself. So this is this is actually the FM from the initial part, and most of like the most of the impact is all, honestly just from the this, the sound itself. Yeah. But then remember that uh, the modulation for this, the modulator, is that uh, FM growl stuff that is, you know, the oldest one ever for me. It's what that was. And that is controlling sort of the main automation, which I think is... It must be this guy. Yeah. And this is the FM from the original patch, which is giving some modulation to the sound, but not a lot. And then this is the main modulation. And then these are the two bra controls. This is the pitch shift from the Vocodex, and then this is the other Vocodex down there. So that's what that is. Much like the other thing, like I made a couple sort of intentional choices, and then I would mostly just make automation uh, sort of variations on things. Like for stuff like this moment, it's actually worth remembering that all of this is happening with a lot of side chaining. Like that sound coming, like kind of fading in. I actually kept the uh, the side chaining there because if I didn't, it, def it didn't really. So like some of the modulation of that sound right there was occurred. It, it happened because of the side chaining on the whole track the ducking uh so yeah a little bit of eq some reverb really really small diffusion which because i just kind of wanted to bounce around more eq which I don't, i'm not totally sure why it's not there and then this uh is a low pass that i turn on uh at the end actually so that, there's that i may do that i may do that before as well but that's the time i remember i remember, I remember doing it Okay, what else? Um, that's base three. Base four. We did base one. I don't think any of these others show up until later. Ah, well, this is this, this guy. So this person is a member layered with the other guy. So here's, here's that. Which, again, I didn't... There's an LFL on this, but I didn't note... Uh, change it it's just there the whole time 
Um, this is pretty like pretty average Reese kind of thing. Eh. Let me get rid of that. Let's put the harmer sounds like by itself. A lot of that. So that's, that's the reverb doing that. That makes that sound like that. Um, okay, a and B here. We got. Uh, okay. So in. Um, I have the local EQ with the lowest harmonic off. So it means the fundamental tone of a part A here is off, but then the fundamental part of B is on, which I think I did to accentuate the LFO on the on the thing more. Uh, I have phase randomness on there. It's pretty uh, regular. Um, super saw thing. I have the harmonizer on, but like at super low values. So like it's mostly accentuating like just regular notes. I have a custom, I have two custom filter shapes engaged. That's interesting. Show me the shape. Show me the shape. Okay, so this is a notch. Could just use a notch. Is this what I'm automating? Like is this what, oh, it's the volume that I'm automating. All right, so that's the filter shape, phaser mask. The phaser is on. And it's on harmonic mode, and for that, for me not messing with this, like the harmonic mode, like it it, re it reacts to what you do with the harmonic using pitch, and there's reasons for that that I haven't quite nailed down, but it, it's, it's like that. So like, ah, so there's there's the phaser doing its thing. It's really slow. This is really slow. Still doing it though. Put the one width. Okay, so I have. Ah, this is where it's doing it. So I have that shape with just like the big, big hole in the middle, and then the width controls how wide it is. So it's opening and closing a, a dark hole essentially, and uh, the LFO is tied to that, and that's making the sound happen. There's no distortion on this. This is just happening like this, and then I have the gross beat. So the gross beat is actually causing that sort of noisy thing to happen, and this is where um, I had the time variable half on, half off. So it's saying all, all change time, no change time. Some change time, not some change time. So the original time is getting in there, and then like, the slower version is coming there as well, which is just unison. We're just doing unison. This is what this is. But for doing unison in post, you usually have to use very specific plugins or just do it manually, where you record, record the sample as a sample and then just record it, uh, place it against itself and the change pitch. That's how you do unison usually. But with gross beat, we could do this live. The line here is hard to tell, but it's like it's like just this tiniest sliver of motion that it can, it can do. These days, where I do it, I actually just automate this thing because you you can actually automate this, and um, I just go to the automation and put the minimum the, the min max knob to put the minimum to ninety nine because that's how tiny of a sliver this is. But that kind of that kind of face cancellation creates that um, well that kind of unison business creates that kind of face cancellation, which is how that sound sort of works. Um, after that, it gets EQ'd some more, and then it gets distorted, finally. And then it gets uh, EQ'd again, and then it gets compressed, because we kind of needed to. This one this one is more about sort of the dynamic range of the whole than anything else. And this is a sort of what I mean when I say that like this is just compression, because it's literally the, the same thing, and if I turned off all the time variables, it would do precisely what the wave shaper does. Just sort of FYI. And then this is there to layer against uh, this guy to make it more interesting because the sound, like, it doesn't happen a lot in the first drop, but it's very distinctive. And if I'm going to be using it as like a main melodic element. It's got to it's gotta be spicier. What are those sounds are happening? So the, the last new sound, okay, it's actually just two, two new sounds. This guy... It was just a sub thing. It's just there to kind of like keep keep the peace with the low end. It's really just a, a, a very low low setting super saw. And like, uh. all right. So I'm, I believe I'm automating this guy. Yep. And then I'm using this guy to control the top end. So it's like this is the one being automated. And then this is this is how hard how high it's ever gonna go, kind of thing. And it stays down here. It doesn't change. I don't, I don't automate any of this. Like, in the song. It's just there. And this to me, this is a filter. I'm not doing anything else impressive. Nope. And then, uh... This is just... <laughs> and then it goes to the sidechain channel where it gets high-passed. Because I'm high-passing everything and replacing it with everyone's up. Um... <laughs> singular. I think that was an AT&T joke. I'm not totally sure. Oh, printer style. I gotta talk about printer style. That's in the drop, too. But, um... And then there's this... 
other ARP. So this is a local EQ, and I just ruined it a lot just to create a strange kind of harmonic profile. And then I use a prism to ruin it even more. And this causes bells. So if I didn't have this, actually the harmonizer is doing a pretty good job of doing it too. Pretty sure that's all that's happening here. Yeah. Like this is enough to kind of. Am I messing with the prism shape? No? Hmm. Am I messing with the prism amount? I am. Okay, so it's it's actually snapping down. So it's a little bit like that pitch that pitch fall that I mentioned before. Um with that with the beginning sound. Is that only we're doing this with the prism and it's not pitching all the way down or even up for that matter, because parts of them are going down and parts of them are going up. Which is an interesting idea. And the harmonizer, I believe, is after everything. So um, I have the phaser on doing its thing, and then I have uh, a filter. I believe it's being, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's plucking itself. And the harmonizer is after that. So the way, the way that the harmonizer works in Harmor is that it doesn't, like, you know, it's not like if I played a note, it would play the other notes. It plays a note, and then it it highlights higher harmonics that would be harmonic with, with the note. So like the harmonic series is, you know, you put a metal, then first harmonic is octave, the next one is fifth, whatever, that kind of thing. So if I wanted to harmonize with an octave, for example, it would go to the next octave and then it would like, it would accentuate that next octave, next fifth, whatever, even though there's more harmonics in between that. And then you do that and it makes you feel like you're playing that, that other note with it. Um, you could tell, you could tell which, like this, this matrix allows you to tell how far and from what and whatnot, that kind of thing. And I really don't know what these mean this offset step shift gap i have the slightest idea but i screw with it you can even randomize it and it'll get some pretty interesting results um so having said that the that this is after the filter is very important because if this was on just the regular the basis the base saw before the filter then it would, it would be the sound that it is and it would get filtered but being after the filter this means that if the filter brings it down and we're still harmonizing it it, it will create frequencies that are beyond the filter's cutoff. It'll, it'll highlight frequencies that are beyond the, the, the filter's cutoff because it's still the series of what's, what's below it. Um, and that creates an interesting effect, and that, that kind of thing. And there's a couple of high bases that are based on this idea. A um, little bit of phaser, a little bit of phaser, but it's just sort of... <laughs> and then I have the odd ARP art mode and it repeats that's what that does the phaser is doing kind of a decent job i have the phaser mask on don't i no nothing not, not doing it's going really fast though so like it the it's hard to tell what's precisely it's doing but uh sorry. that's what it's doing and then uh, that's there and has nothing in post. That <laughs> neat. Let's talk about printer style. So printer style, which has its own volume automation, because it's just so epic, is actually from the hard style track from scratch, also known as Modulators of the Universe, which is on this EP. And it uh, starts its life as a harmer. <laughs> I could have sworn this particular one was a citrus patch, though. This might be a might be the a different one. And I muted the thing. Or something on the side chain. Yeah. So that's the phaser. And this kind of odd configuration of where it's not going the same speed the whole time is 100% the result of the fact we're on harmer, uh, the harmonic mode, and the harmonic use of pitch is doing this. See how the harmonic use of pitch definitely uh, it affects the shape of the phaser when it's a harmonic mode. There's reasons for that. Still not totally sure what. Um, actually, I just thought of a cool uh, test to do later. Anyway, so there's a little bit of prism. Nothing has changed. This is the only thing that's changed. Everything else is face value here. Um, a little bit of unison. Some prism to kind of screw this more. Although the prism also screws with the harmonic, the the, the harmonic mode. Look at that shit. It's great. 
And the first thing that happens is it gets put into uh, <laughs> this EQ here, which is like the world's smallest beta pass. Which I don't think I ever automate. But um, that gets distorted. A lot, but even then it's not that loud. And then puts it through a flanger, kind of mess with it, and it gets put through a distortion again. Man, this is why I have. <laughs> yeah, and then it gets through the distortion again, and then a uh, phaser to screw it some more, and distort it again. And then put through a, a harbor, or rather a reverb, just to give it space. Actually, I think it's because there's a lot of space. Yep. And then get pressed, because it's quiet as hell. <laughs> and it, this is a very hard style thing to do. The kind of the, the the thing about because I have the, the the band pass where it is moving the pitch means that we're moving the harmonics through the band pass. It's a little bit like what happens if we move the band pass, band pass through the harmonics, but it's a little bit different. Sometimes it works, not really all the time. I may have also screwed with it just now when I moved it, but um, it will be unaffected in the version of the FLP that you have. That's a very, like I said, it's a very hard, hard style thing to do. Just kind of like bypass things and then like distort the shit out of it. Really, just kind of to do anything and then to distort the shit out of it. It's a very hard style thing to do. This is derived out of the printer, the printer style lead that's in the uh, modulators of the universe. That was I'm pretty sure was the citrus thing that just sounds like a printer when you play it high enough. So that's gonna be fun when we get to the modulators of the universe uh, making of. I don't think there's anything else in this song of import. This video is long as shit, but that's okay because there's a lot of sound design in here. I hope that uh, helped you if you cared to know about these things. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff. And as usual, have a nice day.